G'day guys, Jason here. Welcome back to my fish room. So in this week's video, we're gonna be doing my full fish room tour for the year 2022. It's gonna be a long video. I'm gonna go into in depth about every single tank I have in here and how I operate the fish room. So why don't you go grab a coffee, sit back and enjoy this week's video. And just to give you guys some context about where we are in the fish room, we're gonna be starting on this rack here and we're gonna be starting in the middle row at the very last tank at the back there. So we're gonna start at that tank there and then we're gonna work our way this way. Then we'll do the top row of tanks and then we'll do the bottom row of tanks. And then we'll switch to this side of the fish room and do those tanks. So the first tank getting an update this year is this one. It has my pride and joy fish in it, my favorite fish in the whole fish room, my breeding pair of white Alto Lamprologus calvus. In the middle of the tank, you can see two large shells. Those shells are called ton shells and that is what I breed my calvus in. They love those shells, they're wide enough for them to fit their body in and they don't get stuck in those shells. On camera, we can see the male. He is the father of hundreds, if not thousands of calvus fry that I've spawned with this breeding pair. And he's actually quite aggressive at the moment. The reason being, his female is in the shell. She's in the shell that's on the left of this uh, footage here and he is guarding her. So he doesn't really like me being in front of the tank at the moment and uh, he's kind of flaring his fins at me. Uh, not too aggressively, but he's keeping a watchful eye on me as I move around the, at the aquarium. So I'm trying to stay as still as possible and uh, try to not stress him out too much. These guys spawned about a week and a half ago and it's actually their ninth spawn. I really can't believe how well this pair have done for me. Uh, so I'm really pleased with them. I bought them as an adult pair, not as a breeding pair. So you're never guaranteed to get a breeding pair uh, just from buying two fish uh, that are sold as a pair. Even if they were sold to me as a breeding pair, there's no guarantee that they would spawn for me as well. Uh, so I took a bit of a gamble with this one and thankfully it really has paid off. And I absolutely love these fish. Uh, their shape, their unique body shape is uh, not really seen in the fish world. Their compressed body, their high beautiful fins, uh, that slender, kind of elongated look that calvus have. I absolutely love it. And that is why they are my channel logo. They're my favorite fish uh, in, uh, out of all the cichlids in the world. These guys by far are my favorite cichlids. So I'm um, starting this fish room tour with my favorite fish. And I hope you can appreciate why they are my favorite fish. Absolutely stunning uh, body shape. That iridescent, those iridescent spots down the side. And uh, yeah, they just got that menacing look even though calvus have that menacing look, they're actually not that aggressive. Although some of my long-term subscribers would beg to differ with some of the footage I've shown them on my black calvus. But anyway, there you go guys. These are on their ninth spawn, and this is my white Alto Lamprologus calvus breeding pair tank. And this is the next tank in the fish room tour. This has more Alto Lamprologus calvus, the white variety. And these guys are actually the fry, the eldest fry that I have from the adult pair you just saw. These guys are pushing the two year mark and you can see the size that they have put on. Not really a lot. Calvus are very slow growing fish and uh, yeah, they take about two years to reach sexual maturity and these guys are pushing that mark now. I have sold quite a lot of these guys and I still have a few left, fortunately. Uh, I absolutely love these fish, as I said with the previous aquarium, uh, but seeing uh, such a large school of calvus in the one aquarium is quite a unique thing to see. You don't see it, don't come along it that often. And I'm very fortunate enough to ha have my very own uh, calvus tank with, uh, I'd, I'd estimate 30 to 40 calvus in the one aquarium. Now I should point out that these aquariums on the middle rack are two foot long by two foot wide by 14 inches high. I've had them custom made for my needs and I like to have shallow wide aquariums uh, for keeping Tanganyikan cichlids. They, a lot of the Tanganyikan cichlids prefer a shallow aquarium to a tall aquarium. There are some obviously exceptions to the rule, but I love the look of these shallow aquariums. But that said, this tank is small for this amount of cichlids. I don't like to do this, but I am forced uh, to do this until I sell off the cichlids that I have in my fish room. Now I do have some more larger tanks coming in the next few weeks. I'm still waiting for them, three, five foot long aquariums and these guys will be going into those aquariums as soon as I get them so they can grow out and put on some more size quicker than they will in this small aquarium. So you just wanna be mindful of that if you're keeping cichlids. I'm quite fortunate with this setup. I have 
all these aquariums on this wall, on this side of the fish room, all connected up to a sump system. So this side of the fish room has over 3,000 litres of water running through it. So these guys get very stable water parameters. That's what they require, that's what they like. And uh, because I've got such a large volume of water, this tank would uh, hold just over 100 litres of water normally, but because it's on such a large sump system, having 3,000 litres of water, uh, the, these guys are okay in here, but I'm really looking forward to getting those larger tanks to get them out of this small tank and, and letting them grow out in the larger aquarium. Anyway, there you go, guys, my white Alto Lampologus Calvus Fry. Love this aquarium. So this is a bit of an unusual tank. Uh, I don't normally like to keep terracotta pots in aquariums. I just think uh, they're unsightly and uh, I like the aquariums to look as natural as possible uh, on this middle row of tanks in my fish room but um, I was forced to put some in here for some shelter for the fish that I have in this aquarium. So in this tank are more calvus. These are Alto Lamprologus calvus but the black variety. I have three adult calvus in here at the moment. There is a fourth that isn't in this aquarium but these guys have been spawning for me. I've spawned them twice in the past year and both spawns were an absolute surprise to me. I did not expect it in the slightest. So the terracotta pots were put in here for aggression, to suppress aggression. As like I said, calvus are generally uh, shy fish. They, uh, don't, they're not a very aggressive fish, even though they look like an absolute predator. They are built for uh, eating fry. They are fry eating machines. They've evolved the way they are to hunt through crevices, tight crevices between rocks to hunt down prey and that's why they have that compressed body shape. However, uh, like I said, they generally are shy fish and not aggressive, even though they have that menacing look. But my four in here have been aggressive when they've been spawning. Now you saw how calm my white calvus breeding pair are and this is how aggressive my black calvus are. Completely different, tearing shreds off each other. So. Unfortunately, when my black calvus spawn, I have to separate the female from the uh, other three and put her in a tank with her fry and let her raise the fry up for about a week. And then I separate her again from the fry and put her in her own tank to recover. Uh, the last two times they've spawned, they've fought pretty badly. So I've had to allow her uh, her own space to uh, recuperate in the cream to recover because these guys were looking like they would fight to the death. But anyway, so I have successfully raised two spawns from these guys now. My, I originally had two black calvus. One looks smaller than the other. They look like a pair, they behave like a pair. And then the smaller one to be, grew to be the same size as the larger one. And then the fight started. Uh, never spawned them for about a year. I then took a gamble, bought another two. Uh, the one that you see on camera right now, just behind the terracotta pond on the left. I believe that is the male and I believe that is the father of the black calvus fry that I have in the fish room now. Uh, there is a smaller one in this aquarium uh, and that is why I bought them because they look like they could be potentially both sexes with the two that I bought, uh, with the two new ones that I bought I should say. And within a month of putting them together they had spawned and I was completely shocked by that. I was basically walking past tank feeding them and I noticed free swimming fry in one of the shells, again a ton shell. Swimming about with uh, four adult calvus in the aquarium completely caught me by surprise, didn't expect it. But I uh, separated them out and uh, successfully raised that, that uh, brood. And then it happened again once I put all the fish back together within about a week they had spawned again unbeknownst to me. I didn't know uh, why they were being so aggressive for so long again. They knew normally when you put them into a new aquarium they're sorting each other out for about 24 hours, 48 hour period, and then everything settles down and they keep to themselves. Uh, but this didn't happen. They were very aggressive for a week, going into a second week, and then I realized that they had actually spawned again. I actually do like or prefer the black calvus more, a little bit more than the white calvus. They're just a little bit more contrast between the black scales and the white iridescent spots on black calvus stand out a little bit more, but both beautiful fish. So there you go, guys, my black Altolamprologus calvus so this tank is a bit of a unique one for my fish room because it has two different types of fish in the one aquarium. If you've been on my channel for a while, you would know I don't really typically keep uh, more than one variety of fish in the one aquarium, uh, but there's a reason for it with this tank. Uh, the first fish you will be noticing on, on screen are the so silvery looking fish. Uh, they are Ventralis tritica and 
I've got a, they're growing out in here and they need a lot of swimming space, open swimming space. You can see on screen there is one that's already displaying uh, male uh, colors, male coloration. Uh, it's coloring up really nicely there. And these are my youngest Ventralis Tritica Fry. They're already uh, showing signs of sexual maturity. So they're in here because the tank that they were originally in was too small for them and they need a lot of swimming space to grow out. They won't be in here for much longer. However, they are playing another role in this aquarium. The main uh, fish in this aquarium are my gold Alto Lamprologus compressor seps. I have three gold comps in here and they are at the back of the aquarium. They are extremely shy fish and I hardly ever see them. They are three, but most of the time on camera, I've only ever gotten two of the smaller ones on camera. The third is the largest and the most intensely colored gold comp I have. So the reason why the Ventralis Tritica are in here with the compressor seps are the Ventralis Tritica are dither fish. They're dither fish for the gold comps and I'm hoping to uh, make the gold comps feel a little bit more at ease by putting in Ventralis Tritica in with them. The gold comps will see there are other fish in the aquarium swimming about that in turn when they see other fish swimming about in open water will signal to the gold comps that there are no predators about that it's safe to come out and swim around uh, if there were no other fish in the tank with them they may think there are predators about and they would constantly hide uh, these ventralis tritica have been in this aquarium with the gold comps for just over a month now and i am seeing the gold comps a little bit more the gold comps do chase the tritica away from the caves uh, but it is bringing the gold comps out of the dark region at the back of the tank there. But um, I did expect to see the gold comps a little bit more than I have. So while it has kind of worked, it hasn't worked to the level I was hoping. Also in this aquarium, I have two uh, bristlenose catfish. They are the normal colored short fin variety and they are part of my cleanup crew. So yeah, my youngest Ventralis fry and my three gold Alto Lamprologus compressor seps. So the next tank in the fish room is one of my favorite tanks as well and this houses my original Neolamprologus Lelupi breeding pair. You can see some of the fry in this tank still with their parents. These fry are getting quite large and I'd love to pull them out and put them in their own grow out aquarium. However again I've run out of tanks and I need more tanks and those tanks are on the way but for the time being these fry are in with their parents. So what have we got in here? We've got two adult Neolamprologus Lelupi. On camera, you just saw the male, and in the top left corner, you can probably see this yellowish object staying put near the bulkhead, and that is the female. Now, Neolamprologus Lelupi, they do unfortunately have a weak bond, and from time to time, the male will belt the female. He will bash her, and that is unfortunately what these guys are going through at the moment. This is about the second or third day that she's been hovering around that corner, and I'm hoping in the next couple of days they will reform their bond and everything will be okay. I suspect what is happening is they're spawning. These fry unfortunately are eating the spawn. For some reason with this female Lelupi, her instinct to protect her newest spawn from the older generations of fry in the same aquarium has diminished, does not protect the younger generations and she simply lets these fry eat the younger spawn. So what I suspect is happening is the male thinks that the female is eating the newest spawn and then he bashes her up. I'm hoping that the female will eventually uh, kick in her instinct and protect the newest spawns from the older generations of fry that I have in the aquarium with them. Now I have lost count of how many times these guys have spawned for me. I have several generations of Lelupi fry in the fish room. And like I said, I would like to take this batch of fry out of here and put them in their own aquarium, but I don't have any tanks. And the other issue I have with removing the fry from their parents is it is a stressful uh, situation for both the fry and the parents. And the other thing is the Lelupi fry are notoriously hard to catch. They've got an unusual swimming pattern when they see the net uh, and they are deceptively hard to catch. So basically when I wanna catch these fry out, I remove all the rocks out of the aquarium and catch the fry, put the rocks back in and leave the pair to spawn again. Now, moving the rocks out and putting the rocks back in kind of resets the territories and then that uh, can sometimes break the bond between your uh, breeding pair of Lelupi. So I don't like to do that too often. Unfortunately, I have to let nature sometimes run its course and that actually benefits the fry. They get a good feed, a highly nutritious feed of uh, Lelupi eggs. They breed quite frequently. About every two weeks, there's a spawn and there's about 200 fry with each spawn. 
So if I was to keep every single spawn that these guys have, I would need a warehouse of tanks to keep all the fry. I'm grateful that I have these pair. They are amazing color. Uh, they're producing amazing looking fry. And I've owned these guys for a year. And the unique thing that happened with this pair is I bought four adults from an aquarium shop. I tried to sex them at the store. There were say about 50 Leilupi in the one aquarium. I tried to pick out two males, two females in the hope that I would get a breeding pair. I thought I'd be lucky to get a breeding pair within a six month period of buying them. That didn't happen. They spawned within 19 days of purchasing them. This is the original pair that I have. Their bond form very, very quickly and actually spawned for the first time. They were still in their quarantine tank when they spawned. Quite amazing. So there you go, guys. My original Neal Emperologus Leilupi breeding pair. So this is the last tank on the middle row and it houses one black Alto Lamprologus calvus. Now that might seem a little bit strange, but the reason for that is I've been using this aquarium for her to recuperate. This is the female that I've spawned twice with and I'm letting her heal up, get her energy back before I put her back with her three other black calvus tank mates. So she's had a lot of room to herself, a lot of space and a lot of time to recover in this aquarium. Uh, unfortunately, um, she's by herself, which I don't really like to do uh, with fish, but I really needed her to gain her energy and strength. And I didn't want to stress her out by having other fish in this aquarium and for her to, to feel like she has to protect her shell. Now, the cool thing with this aquarium is you can see the size of the pit that she has dug. And this is again, a two foot long by two foot wide by 14 inch high aquarium. And you can see the size of the pit that she has dug out around her shell. It's almost the full size of the aquarium. That is why I like to have wide aquariums with my Tanganyik and Cichlids. Now again, this is a black Autolamprologus calvus. Some of you might be wondering why. She looks quite white. And that is because she's not happy with me having the camera in front of her face right now. And, and that is one of the reasons why I constantly tell you guys, if you're gonna keep white calvus and black calvus, keep them separate. You will struggle to sometimes tell them apart from each other because white calvus can turn very dark and black calvus can turn very light. And if you have them in the same aquarium, you will struggle to sometimes tell them apart. So do your best to keep them separate. We don't want crossbreeding in the hobby, or well, a lot of people don't want crossbreeding in the hobby, especially with Tanganyikan cichlids. Uh, some people like to crossbreed Malawi cichlids with the peacocks and whatnot. Uh, that's not my thing, that might be your thing. In the hobby, with, especially with Tanganyikan cichlids, we really wanna keep the, any chance, any possibility of crossbreeding to a minimum. So please, if you are going to keep Atalemprologus calvus, keep the white calvus separate to the black calvus because they will interbreed. But anyway, so this girl, she is on her second spawn. She had her second spawn, had to separate her from the other three black calvus that I already showed you. You saw the fighting, you saw how torn up her lip is. It's still not quite fully healed, but I unfortunately think this is all it's going to heal too. I was also concerned about a month back, uh, she started to develop a lump on her nostril on her right side and uh, I was worried that that might become infected but it didn't it went away it went down and she has pretty much made a full recovery so I will be putting her back with her other uh, tank mates soon I'm just hesitant to do that because I have a feeling when I do it they're gonna spawn again and I don't want them to spawn just yet because I'm not ready I'm not ready to have more calvus fry as you saw earlier in the video my white Alto Lamprologus calvus are on their ninth spawn. I need room for those fry. And if I was to have another spawn of black calvus right now, that really would overflow my fish room. So I'm trying to prevent that to happen from as, for as long as possible. Uh, the only other thing I would uh, like to add in this aquarium is some rocks for her to feel a little bit more at ease. And, uh, some, some, some more shelter for her in here. Uh, but I just haven't done that yet, uh, which is silly of me. There should be more rocks in this aquarium. I shouldn't leave it as barren as it is. Uh, and that is possibly also why she is showing a, uh, a, a more paler look than a normal black calvus would. And the other thing I want to point out is the shell. I spawn them again, all my calvus in ton shells. These shells are nice, have a nice wide opening, perfect for large uh, cichlids to spawn in. I've only ever spawned my calvus in these shells. Uh, you can get narrower shells which look larger, but the opening is narrower, uh, such as these ones but I don't like to use them because I fear that they, the calvus could get stuck in them and won't be able to come out. I have lost cichlids a long time ago in the past with them, uh, with, get, with them getting stuck in shells, and that's why I keep 
these shells, they're much more wider opening and uh, I find that it, they don't have any issue uh, spawning in them, getting in and out of them. The other thing I want to point out with this, with this particular calvus is her strong instinct with this shell. I had my black calvus in the, one of the top row of tanks after they spawned the first time. I left the fry in uh, the two foot aquarium and I moved the four calvus, the four adult calvus out of one of these big aquariums. I let the fry grow out in this size aquarium and uh, the calvus never spawned in, the adult calvus never spawned in the top row of tanks. Uh, they're, 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 those tanks are only two foot wide by one foot long by 14 inches high. I have those tanks on their sides and uh, they never spawned in, 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 those aquari in, in that aquarium and they were in that aquarium for two months. They had some terracotta pots in there and some rocks, no shells. The moment I put them back in their normal aquarium, the two foot wide by two foot long by 14 inch high aquarium, aquarium just like this, they spawned within a week. That was because I had the shell in with them. She associates this shell so much with fry that the instinct is so strong to protect that shell, it overrides her instinct to even protect her fry. Around the fifth day mark, she started to act aggressive towards a fry, protecting the shell from the fry. So she just associates this shell with her territory so much that it even overrides her instinct to protect her own fry. So when I do pop her in to the tank with the three black calvus that she spawns with, I definitely won't be putting in the shell with her until I am ready for them to spawn. Because again, there's gonna be some fights. She's gonna to need to be protected. I'm gonna to need to divide the tank up and I'm gonna to need to, another tank to pop her in to grow out those fry in. So I'm not ready to do that just yet. And that's why she's in this aquarium by herself. I really don't like keeping fish by themselves in the one aquarium. That can alone stress them out being by themselves. Uh, but I wanted to give her as much space and as much time to heal uh, from her wounds when she, and, and the stress that she went through when she was raising those fry. So there you go, my black Altolan prologus calvus breeding female. And now we're on the top row of tanks, pretty much directly above where my white Altolan prologus calvus breeding pair are. So in this aquarium though, we have Altolan prologus calvus. This is some fry and they are the black variety. This is the first spawn that I had of my black Alto Lamprologus calvus. And here they're about five to six months old. You can see they're starting to develop that calvus shape, that unique body shape. Some of them still, however, look quite young. Some of them look like they're about a month old, uh, but they are all from the same batch. Calvus fry grow at different rates, and it is suggested that you try to keep the different sizes separate because they will cannibalize their smaller brothers and sisters, even though they are the same age. So that is one of the things I do suggest that you do. Fortunately, haven't had to do that too often, probably three or four times. But again, these are my black Alto Lamprologus Calvus Fry, the oldest black Calvus Fry that I have. I don't normally have lights on my Calvus Fry tanks when they're growing up. Uh, purely because the light turning off and on can shock them and when they're at a young age they are very delicate fish. I've found that myself uh, through the experience of me raising and breeding the calvus fry that uh, they are quite skittish and quite delicate at a very young age. So I keep the light off the tank for approximately the first six months of their life. I don't have the light on basically. I just have the ambient light of the fish room lighting their tanks. That's more than enough that they need for a day night cycle, more than enough than they need that they need for, to see their food. I've had much better success rate having no light on the aquariums when I have calvus fry growing out, at least for the first six months. And I apologize for my long-term subscribers. They're gonna hear this again, uh, but for any new guys who haven't been on my channel, just a quick rundown of what I do with my calvus fry. I put some pool filter sand in this instance, uh, pool filter sand in this aquarium. I don't like to run my calvus tanks bare bottom. When I was running the tanks bare bottom, they would sit on the bottom of the tank. There'd be algae growth on the bottom of the tank. And that algae growth, the mold that they were sitting in, I found caused uh, diseases and infections on the underside of the fish. I was noticing some of the fry were developing like a white powdery looking look to the edges of their fins. Whenever those fish, those fry developed that appearance, they slowly died away and I was losing fry from my first lots of calvus fry spawns, which was very unfortunate and very disheartening. Through trial and error, I worked out that I shouldn't run the tanks bare bottom. I should have a substrate, a very, very clean substrate on the bottom of their tanks 
because one of the things calvus do, and this goes for compressor steps as well, alto lamprol lagus compressor steps, fry do this as well, they sit on the bottom of the tank for very long periods of time. They do this for months and these fry still do it. And if the bottom of the tank is dirty, they can develop infections and that's what happened to my fish. So when I'm preparing a tank to grow out calvus, newly born calvus fry, I clean the tank thoroughly. I put a fresh sand bed down on the bottom of the tank. Then I put the fish in. I don't introduce any bristlenose catfish as a cleanup crew. Because calvus like to sit on the bottom of the tank for long periods of time, having bristlenose catfish in your aquarium will stress your calvus fry out because the calvus fry also sit at the bottom of the aquarium. When the calvus fry are trying to sleep, the bristlenose catfish are nocturnal, they'll be awake. They'll be stressing out the calvus even more. So I don't put any bristlenose catfish in the tank with them as part of the cleanup crew. The other thing, you don't need the bristlenose catfish in the aquarium because the lights are off, so you won't be getting any algal growth. The bottom of the tank will remain clean and you won't have any of those problems with a dirty tank. The bristlenose catfish are messy eaters and messy poopers. Not having any bristlenose, not having any lights on, having a nice clean bottom tank is perfect for raising calvus fry. And I've found I have almost 100% success rate when I do that. The last thing I don't do as well is I don't put any lids on the calvus fry grow out aquariums. When they're this size, there's absolutely no chance that they're gonna jump out of this aquarium. You're obviously gonna have water evaporating from the system, from the aquarium, but I just bear that because I don't wanna stress these guys out. I was finding clinking the glass lid on the tank, lifting it up to feed them, putting it back down, that clinking of the glass, it's inevitable. Even if you use plastic, you're gonna make some little sounds that are gonna go through the aquarium and that's gonna stress the fish out. I literally did see one calvus fry ages ago, one of my first spawns, have looked like a spasm, like a fit, and literally die right in front of me the moment I clinked the glass when I was trying to feed them. So, let my lessons the hard way, but heed my advice, don't use any glass lids on your aquariums. Don't use lids at all on the calvus tanks when they're this young. When they are a little bit bigger, and I'll show you what size I put the glass lids on, I will put the glass lid on because they will be able to jump out of the tank. At this size, there's no way they're gonna be able to jump out. This is the list of things that I do. No glass lids up to this size calvus fry, no bristlenose catfish, clean bottom tank, and no light. You do those four things, you will successfully raise your calvus or alto limb prologus compressor steps fry. Anyway, so that's the first calvus fry tank. So the next tank again is alto limb prologus calvus, but these are the white variety. So and I'm not sure if you can see it on camera. I've just popped some baby brine shrimp in this aquarium just so you can see the amount of fry that are in this aquarium. So they're coming now towards the front of the tank and you'll be able to see them a little bit better. So I didn't mention the last uh, on the last tank what I feed the guys. When they're this size, I feed them a range of baby brine shrimp, live microworms and crushed pellets that are soaked in aquarium water before I feed the fish. I like to soak the pellets that I feed to my cichlids purely because I don't want the pellets to expand in the fish's gut. If you are pre-soaking your pellets, they'll expand in a container, then you feed them to the fish and the fish will only eat what they need. They won't overeat. This will prevent your fish from overeating and engorging themselves on so much food. So I really recommend that you pre-soak the pellets first, feed them to your fish, and then they will only eat what they need. They won't overeat. I was finding when I wasn't pre-soaking pellets, the fish were overeating, they were especially the ones that would eat the most, they'd quickly eat before any of the other fish could eat. So, so they'll get the most pellets, say, in their gut. And then they were, well, I suspect, developing swim bladder problems because once the pellets were in their gut, they would expand and crush their internal organs. That's something I've noticed, that's something I suspect, I don't know if I'm correct, but just from my observations, that's what I've found. Since I've began pre-soaking pellets and then feeding to the fish, I don't get any swim bladder problems anymore. So what I recommend you do with your calvus fry, give them a wide range of foods, uh, just so you're ensuring that they're getting the wide range of vitamins and minerals they need to grow into healthy adult fish. Do not feed them just constantly brine shrimp. Uh, they, they might be missing out on some minerals and vitamins that are important for their development. So there you go, guys. These are the white Alto Lamprologus calvus fry. And this is the next tank on the top row. Again, more Alto Lamprologus calvus fry. These are my youngest white calvus fry. And you can, again, you can see them, they're feeding on some baby brine shrimp. Like I said, on the previous two tanks, calvus fry like to sit on the bottom of the tank when they're uh, resting. And because of that, you won't see them. So uh, just for the purpose of filming, I'm popping in some baby brine shrimp so they get them up into the water column so you can easily see the fry. Purely got the light on this tank just to show you 
what the fish look like for this fish room tour. And again, these guys will be just having uh, the ambient light of the fish room while they grow up. And then as they grow to a little bit larger, they'll be okay with a day night cycle directly, a light directly on their aquarium once they're free swimming in the water column more permanently. Uh, and that doesn't happen for at least, I find for at least the first six months, uh, they, they like to sit on the bottom of the tank. And even then they'll still sit at the bottom of the tank. So uh, I don't introduce bristlenose catfish in my calvus aquariums until they're pretty much fully free swimming, staying in the water column for long periods of time. And that generally happens after around the six month uh, mark when they've started to develop that calvus shape. There you go guys, more of my white outer lampologus calvus fry. So onto the next tank. So surprise, surprise, white outer lampologus calvus fry. <laughs> this is pretty much my third, fourth generation of calvus fry, white calvus fry and they're just over a year old here. One of the things you'll notice in this aquarium, there's no double-headed sponge filter at the back of the tank, just an airline hose uh, giving some aeration to this aquarium. Now, the airline hose doesn't really need to be in here because, again, these tanks are all hooked up to a central sump. They get their oxygen from the sump and it's pumped into this aquarium. So that is just there pretty much just to give them a little bit more flow in this aquarium. And so if, if there was for some reason to be a short with one of my uh, return pumps, this tank will be fine and would still have some aeration in it. So that's a bit of a backup redundancy thing. I just don't actually have enough double-headed sponge filters for all the aquariums. But when I got the other tanks that you'll see on the other side of the fish room, I took some of the double-headed sponge filters out and popped them in there. So that's why this one has just got that airline hose there. But anyway, my point of showing you this tank is, you can see the size that these calvus are at now. Again, they're almost the one year mark. Uh, they're getting that calvus shape, that beautiful compressed body shape, long elongated body, and that's typical for calvus. And at this size, you wanna have a lid on your aquarium, okay? So if you've got uh, about a one inch gap from the water uh, surface to the edge, the top edge of your aquarium, these guys could possibly jump out of that at this size. Now, I will be moving these guys out soon. When I get those five foot tanks, they won't be in here for much longer and they'll be growing out in a larger tank and uh, putting on size fairly, uh, fairly quickly. And Calvus Fry are slow growers, some of the slowest growing cichlids in the cichlid world at this size. They're a lot hardier than the uh, younger fish I just showed you, the younger Calvus I just showed you, a little bit more delicate. I want to treat them uh, with a little bit more caution. Uh, again, not having the light on the aquarium, not having lids, no bristlenose catfish to stress them out. When the fish are this size, they're quite all right, a little bit more hardier. Okay, on to the next tank. Okay, the next tank, we've got another breeding pair of Neolamprologus Leilupi. You can see the amount of fry they've got in this aquarium, way too much. I really don't want to be spawning these guys in an aquarium this size. They need a larger aquarium like the original breeding pair that you already saw. They need an aquarium that size, but I have nowhere else to put them at the moment. Again, those tanks are coming and these guys will be in their own grey out aquarium, uh, as well as the parents in their own two foot wide by two foot long by 14 inch high aquarium. These guys aren't gonna be in here for much longer. They're gonna go onto the middle rack. They're actually gonna go into the aquarium that has my lone black Alto Lampralogus calvus female. They'll be going into that aquarium and uh, they'll be spawning in there in the future. Uh, once I move that black calvus female in with the rest of the black calvus, the other three black calvus that I have in her normal tank, these Leilupi will go into that tank and they'll have a lot more room. They'll be able to exhibit their natural behavior of digging and feel way more at ease than they do in this aquarium. Uh, you can see this is a bare bottom tank with Leilupi, you can keep a bare bottom tank. The, the fry I find are a lot more hardier than calvus fry and uh, having some mom on the bottom of the tank is, doesn't pose a problem to Leilupi fry. They, once they are free swimming, they don't sit on the bottom of the tank for long periods of time like the calvus do. So that is why I leave this tank bare bottom with uh, algae and mom on the bottom of the tank. Now in this aquarium, we've got some terracotta sources that I've used a hole saw to cut uh, through uh, to make a hole in the, in the sources. So basically what you wanna do, if you wanna make a semi-neat hole in a saucer, clamp two sources together so they're facing each other, get your hole saw, go through, and you've got two caves done in one go. I did a video of it last year, how to do that, and it looks somewhat neat, uh, and it's very easy to do because terracotta's uh, nice and soft. 
So you don't really need an expensive hole saw to do that. Just a drill bit on the end of your drill and it will make the hole for you. So you can see the female going in the cave there, male hovering around, um, he's fry. And in here at the back, we've got, again, got a double headed sponge filter. There's no bristlenose catfish in this aquarium. That's why there is some algae on the sides of the tank. Uh, however, that's okay because the Leilupi feed off that algae during the day. There's microorganisms in that algae and they'll be picking that off, picking up the algae, and that uh, contributes to their diet. So that's good for them. And again, if I was to put bristlenose catfish in this aquarium, with hardly any aquascaping in there, uh, any shelter for the bristlenose catfish to hide in, they'll just get killed by the Leilupi, the adult pair are quite aggressive with other fish. So uh, I don't do that. I just clean the tank myself. Uh, and I just basically just clean the front pane of glass. I don't worry about the sides because again, it's food for the Leilupi fry. Now, uh, this is my second breeding pair. So the original pair you saw, they formed their bond first. And then I was left with these two excess Leilupi. And it just so happened, I picked out the perfect ratio. I picked out two males and two females at the aquarium shop. And then these guys formed the pair, the excess fish. I didn't know that would happen. I really didn't think it would happen. But yeah, got very lucky with that. This male would not accept the female for a very long time. And then he grew to accept her. And at first they would spawn and he would eat the fry. And I said on a number of videos that I'm gonna persist with him. I'm not gonna try and take the female out with the fry and then try to raise them myself. I want him to become a good parent and learn to look after his fry. I want him to develop that instinct with his fry and that succeeded. It did take a while. It took about five to six spawning attempts to get him to finally stop eating his fry. But now I don't have to worry about looking after the fry myself. If I was to pull the fry out and pull the female out and let her raise the fry herself, I could risk killing the female when I reintroduce her to the male, breaking their bond, putting them back together. Just, you've got to be patient with these fish, let them form their bond and it will work. And that's what happened with this pair. With my original breeding pair, my original breeding pair of Leilupi, the male never ate the fry. It was perfect from the word go. But this guy, uh, this male you see here, he took quite a bit of time to get used to not eating his fry. And you can see there's two actual spawns in this tank uh, of Leilupi fry in this aquarium, and they're doing really, really well. With my original pair, I said the female doesn't defend the new spawn from the older generations of fry. This female does though, she actually does. When she spawns, she defends the new spawn from the fry you see here. And that's why in this aquarium with these Leilupi, I've been able to raise multiple generations in the one aquarium. So learn something new there. Fish are always gonna be a little different, even in the same species there. Their own behaviors, their own little characteristics that they have, their own little traits, they're all gonna be a little bit different. It's not always gonna be the same. You, you, if you were to watch a video that says Leilupi do X, Y, and Z, that might be true for that pair, but for a different pair, they'll behave differently. So again, with this pair, the female looks after the younger generations, protects them from the older fry, whereas my other Leilupi female, she doesn't do that at all. The older Leilupi fry eat the younger generations, and I can only, unfortunately, with that pair, raise one generation of fry up. But there you go. So this is my second breeding pair of Neolamprologus Leilupi they have in the fish room. And another reason why I cannot possibly uh, grow out every single spawn that they have is because I've got not only one breeding pair, but two breeding pair that are punching out almost 200 fry per fortnight. Great problem to have though in the fish room. Anyway, on to the next tank. Okay, so this tank, where's the light? Wondering why there's no light on this aquarium. It's right next to the Leilupi tank, but there's no light. Uh, that's because, again, this is Autolamprologus calvus fry. So what I've got on this LED light is some black plastic just blocking the light from going into the aquarium. The light that they're getting from the other tanks uh, in the fish room, the ambient light in the fish room is more than enough, again, for a day-night cycle. So what I'm gonna do now is remove that black strip of plastic, and you'll see how bright the tank is then. There we go. So I'm actually gonna have to turn the exposure down and how cool is that, guys? <laughs> I don't get to see these fry at this size that often with this amount of light on, so it's quite unique. Uh, again, calvus fry, I don't keep the light on the aquarium. And if I have to have a light on there, because there's other fish on either sides of the aquarium that do require light, 
I just use a piece of plastic to block the light on the specific aquarium I don't want any light in. So again, like the other Calvis tanks, these guys have a nice clean bare bottom tank. There's no lid on the aquarium. Again, the light is blocked and there are no bristlenose catfish in here. You can see the amount of fry that are in here. And these are black Alto Lamprologus Calvus fry. This is the youngest black Calvus fry that I have in the fish room. And they're approximately a month, maybe six weeks old here. So if you are gonna try to breed Calvus or Compressorceps, just heed my advice. No light, no bristlenose catfish, nice clean tank with nice clean substrate and no lid. Do those four things and you'll have success like this with your Calvus or Compressorceps fry. And believe it or not guys, I have different types of cichlids in this fish room other than calvus. <laughs> These guys are Lamprologus oscillatus gold. These are the oldest fry I have. Now, if you've been on my channel for a while now, you would know that I lost my breeding trio of Lamprologus oscillatus gold last year in 2021. The trio of them uh, died within the month of each other. Don't know exactly why, although I do have my suspicions that it may have been because I moved the Neolamprologus Lelupi in next door to where the breeding trio of Ocelotus Gold were. That potentially stressed the Ocelotus Gold out and they all died within a month of me uh, moving the Lelupi in the fish tank next to them. So that's the only reason why I think they could have died. Uh, no other fish uh, has died for me touch wood uh, since then. Now these guys, again, they're not used to having a camera shoved in their face so they are looking a bit skittish, a little bit scared. And you can see the double-headed sponge filter has come loose from the back of the aquarium. Unfortunately, that's what happens sometimes with these double-headed sponge filters. The suction cups degrade over time. The suction cups are pretty much two years old, so it's expected that that's gonna happen. I have a rock at the back of the tank, just keeping it in place there. And again, it's providing them oxygenated water as well as getting oxygenated water from the sump. Now, a couple of things about this aquarium. Like I showed you before, I don't like to have mixed aquariums, but this does have a mix of fish in it. It's got my Lamprologus of Solatus Gold, obviously, as well as four pretty large now Ventralis Chaitika that I really need to get out of here and move them into another aquarium because I need the swimming space. So uh, it's also got some bristlenose catfish in here as part of the cleanup crew. Uh, fortunately, I can keep some bristlenose catfish in this aquarium with these fish. Also, the other thing is some of you may or may not be aware Lamprologus of Solatus Gold. They are a shell dwelling cichlid from Lake Tanganyika. And you might notice there are no shells in this aquarium. What I do have, however, is PVC pipe cut in one to two inch lengths. The PVC pipe is fine for the shell dwellers to live in. Uh, it just makes things a little bit easier when you're catching your shell dwellers out to bag them up and sell them to an aquarium shop or to other hobbyists. If you have shells in the aquarium, they'll just dive into the shell and you'll never be able to get them out without breaking the shell or waiting a long time for them to swim out naturally. So if you have PVC pipe in your shell dwelling tanks where you're raising shell dwelling cichlids up from fry, that is perfectly fine and uh, they will exhibit their natural behaviors. They'll move the PVC around. Sometimes they'll move, stand, I've seen them actually stand the PVC up on their, on their, on their ends uh, using their mounts to lift up the PVC pipe. Quite interesting to see that behavior. Uh, and if there was sand in this tank, they'll be digging around those PVC pipes. They can also spawn in the PVC pipes. Nice if you were to put an end cap on the end. If you don't have any shells, you can do that. But purely because I grow out my shell dwellers in tanks like this, I don't want them going into shells because I won't be able to catch them to sell them. So yeah, that's this tank. That's my Lamprologus Ocelotus Gold and uh, some fairly old uh, Ventralis Tritica fry that are gonna be moved out of this tank soon. And next to the Lamprologus Ocelotus Gold is this aquarium. And this tank holds my uh, third oldest <laughs> spawn of white Alto Lamprologus Calvus fry. So in here, we've also got some bristlenose catfish as part of the cleanup crew to keep this tank clean. You can see how clean the, uh, the tank is, the bare bottom. Again, Calvus fry like to sit on the bottom of the tank, so I try to keep the bottom of the tank clean. But because these fry are much older, they're pretty much a year old here, I don't have to worry about them sitting on the bottom of the tank because they, don't pretty, they pretty much don't do that now uh, at this age. They will just stay in the water column the entire time. And so because they stay in the water column, they don't sit on the bottom of the tank, I am able to keep bristlenose catfish with calvus fry that are this size, that are this old. The other thing with this aquarium is they're fine with the light being on and off this aquarium. There's no problems there. And also I have, because these calvus fry are this size, I also have a lid on this aquarium. It's because they will be able to jump out of this tank if I didn't have the lid on here. 
So when these guys were born, I unfortunately didn't have the experience, uh, all the knowledge that I have now with raising Calvus fry. So this is just one batch. I believe I probably had about 70 originally from this spawn. And unfortunately, because I didn't know about the clinking of the glass and the lights and uh, having a nice clean bare bottom tank for your fry, for your Calvus fry, and not having uh, bristlenose catfish in with the Calvus fry, I lost quite a few of them. And this is all that remains from that spawn. So this was pretty much my third or fourth spawn. And from then on, I've had much more success because I learned from my mistakes. So there's probably about 20 to 30 fry left in this batch. So I lost over half, but I've obviously again, learned from my mistakes. Okay, on to the next tank. And this tank has some Neal and Prologus Brevis Sunspot, another shell dwelling cichlid from Lake Tanganyika, nowhere near as aggressive as the Lamprologus Ocelotus Gold you previously saw. And in here at the front of the tank, on the front pane of glass, you probably see two albino bristlenose catfish. They're getting quite large. They're both males. I can see bristles developing on their snouts. Again, these are shell dwelling cichlids from Lake Tanganyika. You can see there's no shells in here. They're quite fine. We're just the PVC pipes. These guys were fry that I've grown out and I do intend to sell them at my local fish store and cichlid club. So unfortunately due to COVID, I haven't been able to go to the club. The club meetings have been canceled. So when they return, when they resume, these guys will be for sale and they'll go. Brevis Sunspot are kind of getting common now these days in the hobby, which is great to see. There are a lot more, there are a lot more of them available, but uh, they're not as common as Multifasciatus. These guys are a little less common than them. Uh, then you've probably got your Ocelotus Gold, which are the next common. And then probably after Ocelotus Gold, just in terms of rarity, would be similar, which looks similar to Multifasciatus. These guys are well and truly over a year old and really need to move them on. Okay, on to the next tank. And you can probably tell what these next fish are. Beautiful looking Neolamprologus Leilupi. These are the oldest fry that I have from my original breeding pair. So these guys here, pretty much one year old now to the day. You can get Leilupi in different color forms from brown to cream to black to white to orange to bright yellow. Uh, these guys are in the bright yellow to orange range. Now in this aquarium in terms of shelter for them, again, I've just got some PVC pipes cut up in one to two inch lengths. There is a rock at the back holding the sponge filter, that double headed sponge filter in place. They like to hide behind that as well. Uh, and there is some algae growing on the sides of the tank. Again. Leilupi, they'll pick up the algae. There is no bristlenose catfish in this aquarium. Leilupi, unfortunately, do bully the bristlenose catfish, so I don't want to stress any bristlenose out and potentially harm them, so I don't keep them in here. I just let the algae grow. Now, some of them are pushing the two inch mark. Uh, there are actually two generations in this tank from the original pair, and I can't wait for those five foot aquariums because these guys are going to go in there the moment those aquariums arrive. Yeah, there you go, my oldest Neolamprologus Leilupi fry. Really love this tank and their colour. This tank is next to the Leilupi you just saw, and these are more Neolamprologus Leilupi fry. Probably now you can get a sense of why I cannot possibly keep all the Neolamprologus Leilupi spawns that I have from my two breeding pairs. So these guys are about six months old. They're pushing the one inch mark and they're showing that typical yellow Leilupi coloration. Love these guys. You can see this is actually one spawn. This is just all one spawn here uh, that I pulled out from the parents tank. And these uh, did come from my original breeding pair. They've got that beautiful gold coloration coming through now. There are actually bristlenose catfish in this aquarium as well. When the Leilupi are this size, they're not gonna really be able to pick on the bristlenose catfish, especially if the bristlenose catfish are quite large. So it's quite fine to keep uh, your bristlenose catfish in with the Leilupi fry when they're this size. Anyway, so there's just the rock at the back there. You can see there's no PVC in here. Uh, these guys are doing quite fine. They're fine in open water. They do prefer rocks, but uh, it just makes my life easier when I'm catching them out to sell. However, that said, these guys are not at a sellable size yet. They're just pushing that one inch mark. The other guys, two and a half inches, they definitely are at the sellable size. But anyway, there you go. This is my other Neal Amprologus Leilupi grow out fry tank. Now, unfortunately, the last tank on this row is pretty hard to film with the setup that I have rigged up right now, which is pretty precarious. I have the tripod partly on a big ladder and partly on my footstool. So uh, I don't like filming like this, but I have to because I wanna show you guys pretty good quality footage of the fish that I have in the top row. So here's my setup, the DSLR filming the last tank of my Lamprologus Ocelotus Gold. You can see how precarious the setup is. We've got two tripod legs in this big ladder here. 
with the large tripod leg going all the way down to my footstool right on the edge. It has to be on the edge, doesn't it? I can't get this footstool any closer to the ladder. So that's where that uh, tripod leg is. So you can see <laughs> it's a bit dodge, but it does the job. And yeah, I can't move this ladder any further because I've got my water drums here. So that's why it's on an angle like that. So anyway, onto this aquarium. These guys are the youngest generation of Lamprologus ocelotus gold. They have in the fish room, they're the last spawn that my breeding trio had before they unfortunately passed away. And they've got that gold coloration that obviously Lamprologus ocelotus gold have. And they've got a beautiful purple blue iridescence on their belly. Now, unfortunately, as you can see, I did get a bit lazy with this aquarium and there are shells in this shell dwelling tank. And uh, like I said in my, I showed you the other videos of the shell dwelling cichlids that I have on this top row. I don't like to have shells when the fry are growing out because they're ex exceptionally hard to catch. So I'm gonna have to spend some time one day taking the shells out, separating the uh, Lamprologus ocelotus gold fry from their shells because I will have to sell these guys eventually. Now, am I gonna keep the, any Lamprologus ocelotus gold offspring for me to breed? Uh, I'm leaning towards that being a no. I've bred hundreds of these guys now and I want to try something else. Maybe in the future, if I do come across a good quality bloodline of Lamprologus ocelotus gold, I'll give them a try again, but I'm just gonna sell all these guys off and give some other fish a try. Anyway, there you go guys. That's the entire top row of tanks, all my fry grow out tanks. And now to the tanks on the bottom row of the sump system. This is one of two four foot long aquariums that are two foot wide by two foot high. And as you can see in here, I'm doing again what I don't like to do, which is mix cichlids together, especially when you're trying to breed them, I don't like to do that. However, in here, I have uh, a mix of cichlids. This is pretty much my only community aquarium, and it also houses the only Lake Malawian cichlid that I have in the entire fish room. And that cichlid is the Kawanga Golds. As you can see, there's a male, bright yellow male with black barring down the sides of his body. He's in here with his females and two other males that he dominates. And those two males look brown because of that dominance. And also in this aquarium are some of his fry. Also in this aquarium are my breeding colony of Ventralis tritica along with some of their fry. If you look closely in here, you might spot a female that's holding a mouthful of fry. And also I've got a breeding pair of Julidochromus regani and they inhabit the bottom of the aquarium and the, the rock piles. You can also see in here some small regani. All the regani you see in here, bar the breeding pair, were spawned in this aquarium. The fish in here obviously would have eaten some of the fry, but the majority, I believe, survived and are now pushing two inches. <laughs> so um, you can see footage of them here uh, when I had them as young fry in this aquarium and you can see the size of the other fish and they weren't deterred. They were well protected in here by their parents and um, yeah, it was great to see that behavior, that interaction with small fish and large fish and how they were pretty much ignored. So you can see the male ventralis, this guy here on the right of the aquarium is the father of all the ventralis fry that I have. There is another male on the left. He only started coloring up once I added all the Kawanga gulls to this aquarium. Now that there's more fish to spread aggression amongst in this tank, uh, he was able to color up. But now that he has so many other fish to defend against, he can't dedicate that, that much time to that other male. So uh, his aggression is spread amongst all the cichlids you see here. There's no bristlenose catfish in this tank. I just keep the glass uh, clean on the front pane. I let the Kawanga Golds eat the algae on the sides of the tank. Being Mbuna, they like to graze on algae. I let them do their thing in here and they kind of keep the algae at bay. Again, I just need to clean the front pane of glass. Uh, I don't have bristlenose catfish that are large enough to go in this aquarium, unfortunately, so I just clean it myself. Anyway, on to the next tank. And the other four foot aquarium I have in the fish room is this one, and it houses my Neolamprologus tetracephalus. Now, in this aquarium, there are only four fish. That's a large aquarium to only house four fish in, and that is because the tetracephalus are a very aggressive cichlid from Lake Tanganyika. They need a lot of room, and if anything, they need an even larger tank than this four footer. I probably should have them in a six footer, to be honest with you. Uh, you. You need a lot of space for these guys because of their level of aggression. Now, again, like the Kawanga Golds, you can see them fighting there. They're extremely aggressive. These guys have been brought up together. Like the Kawanga Golds, I won these in a fish raffle, 
and I've kept Tretz before, that's what they're commonly known as, or five bar cichlid, poor man's Fontosa, some other common names that they're uh, called. I also had a funny comment on my Instagram page where a guy called them fake Toza. I love that name for him. I think that's pretty clever and uh, maybe that will catch on. So if you want to follow me, I do have an Instagram page, uh, Jason Cichlids, just follow me on there and you'll get more frequent updates, uh, nice photos that I take of my fish. Uh, and sneak peeks into upcoming videos on my Instagram page. But anyway, with these fish, they were all about 1.5 inch long and they've been together that entire time. I did at one point have the Kawenga Golds in with them uh, to spread the aggression amongst the four uh, trets, but I've since removed the Kawenga Golds because I want to breed these guys. I have successfully spawned them at least 12 times, I, I believe. I've lost count. I am yet to successfully raise even one fry up to adulthood. So these guys, I find, for me, are a lot more difficult to breed than the calvus, and calvus aren't exactly an easy cichlid to breed themselves. Uh, but yeah, these guys, for some reason, for me, with these four, I haven't been able to successfully breed them. Some people I see have been fine uh, breeding them and you know the the parents raise the fry themselves but these guys for some reason aren't doing that now you've got the big male who patrols the bottom of the tank and i know the largest trek in here is the male they are very hard to sex even at uh, adulthood they all look the same the females have the exact same coloration pretty much as the males you can't even tell the sexes with the typical way say pointier dorsal and pointier anal fin. They don't really exhibit that. The males don't really exhibit that feature. So it is hard to sex these guys. However, in here, I do know I have at least two females. And the reason I know that is because I've seen him spawning with two females in this tank. Now, I was led to believe that these guys uh, would only form a pair and they'll, would, they'll only come together to spawn and then after the fry have hatched, bond would break. If you think the bond between uh, Leilupi is weak, <laughs> these guys are on a whole nother level. I've seen that male spawning with two females in this aquarium, so they definitely will spawn with however many females there are in the tank. Now, there are four fish in here. One of them I know he's never spawned with, but I do suspect that it is also a female. If it's a male, he has stunted its growth uh, and I'm surprised he hasn't killed it off but I think he hasn't killed it off because it is a female as well. If this tank was larger, that third fish might have enough room in, this, in, in its aquarium. The male that you see at the bottom of the tank, the large fish there, he might spawn with that fish as well. And unfortunately, sometimes they spawn on the actual sand bed and they, when they're digging, they're inadvertently picking up eggs with sand and spinning them out. So it's another reason why I haven't had much success with these guys. They have on occasion spawned on uh, the slate or on the bottom of the tank on the actual glass. I have tried to raise the fry several times. Can't get them past the two week age. I might try something new. I might put these guys in the five foot aquarium. We'll see uh, when they arrive, but I'm hesitant to do that because these guys are aggressive as it is. Again, they're having a go at the side of the tank there. They just do not stop fighting. I wouldn't recommend you keep these guys with smaller Tanganyika and cichlids. Uh, you'd want them to be with large, large fish just due to their aggression and as well as their size. The male has actually bitten me and drawn blood from my hand on several occasions when I've tried to take the fry out to raise them myself because I know they won't do it. Uh, but yeah, his level of aggression is on another level and they will draw blood from my hand. They have in the past, so imagine what they can do to other fish. So I don't recommend you keep these guys with any fish unless they are large fish that are larger than the trets themselves. Anyway, we'll see what happens with these guys. I am considering selling them and trying something different because I have persisted with them for almost two years now and not one single fry. Anyway, onto the other side of the fish room. Okay, so this is the other side of the fish room. All these tanks are run individually. The previous tanks you saw in my fish room tour so far, they're all connected to a central sump. They're all connected up to each other. Water can flow from one tank to another. On this side of the fish room, these tanks are all individual. So when I do water changes, I have to change water out of every single aquarium and pump water into every single aquarium. On the other side of this, with the sump system, I only have to take water out of one or two aquariums each week, top that water back up, and then that dilutes all the water in the fish room on that rack. So I'm gonna show you now all the aquariums on this side of the fish room. We'll start in the middle row, and again, like the previous bit, we're gonna start in the middle row from that side and then work our way down. We'll then go to the bottom row of tanks 
and then work our way to here, and then we'll do the top rower tanks. So let's get into it. And this is the first tank on the rack that I'm going to show you. It houses my Neolamprologus Brevis Sunspot breeding trio. You can also see there are some fry in here that are quite large. I should move them out of here and pop them in with the fry that I already showed you on the other rack. Uh, however, I just haven't done that. And uh, you can see they coexist with their parents. However, no new fry are surviving because the older fry that are in here pick off the new spawns. Unfortunately, they do not step breed, uh, not like multifasciatus. I have to split out all the fry from the younger uh, fry that come through. So the females of the Brevis Sunspot develop a nice yellow area on their belly and that's what gives them their name. The male does not exhibit that feature. Uh, he's a lot larger than the females, pretty much double their size and a lot bulkier. And yeah, he's got his two girls in the middle there. He just alternates between one shell and the other and uh, they are the parents of all the fry you've seen in my fish room. There are some of the fry that are starting to color up. I can tell they are female. They're getting that gold coloration on their belly as well. And he might start to spawn with them as well. Not that I really want him to do that, but that's nature and that's what happens. So uh, I'm gonna have to move these guys out of here soon. Once I get those five foot tanks, they're gonna save me, obviously. And once things start opening up again, where uh, we've got our club meets and I can start to sell these fish once again. So looking forward to that. I have also considered selling the breeding trio as well because again, I've bred hundreds of these guys now and I'd like to try some other types of fish. Really interesting behavior and a fun fish to watch. You can see they don't dig anywhere near as normal shell dwelling cichlids do. Uh, at least my trio don't. Uh, and they just dig like a little pit around the shell, uh, move it around and that's about it. Uh, but uh, compared to multifasciatus or ocellata skull, brevis don't dig anywhere near as much as those guys. So I just have a shallow sand bed in here. Anyway, there you go guys, my Neolamprologus brevis sunspot breeding trio and fry. Okay, so in here, uh, two Neolamprologus similis. These guys with their name similis, they look very similar to multifasciatus, however have much more striking barring down the side of their body, as well as uh, additional barring on their head that multifasciatus don't have. See there's two in here, I bought them a while back. Uh, I've got some shelves in the front and some slate in there for some shelter. And, um, however, they haven't spawned for me. I did expect some spawning activity by now, well and truly by now. However, I do believe these guys are either both males or both females. I think they're both males. So I need to source some more of these fish and pop them in here and then we'll see some spawning activity. I really wanna spawn them. I wanna document that for you because I do believe these guys are a very interesting fish. They don't come by them often in uh, Sydney. Uh, there are some out there, but I just wanna document that process and uh, spawn them because I've never spawned similars before. Spawned multifasciatus countless times before when I was younger. And I wanna give these guys a try because again, I think these are a little bit more striking than uh, multifasciatus. I'm really looking forward to showing you guys that uh, in detail once I do source some additional similars. But you can see the amount of digging these guys have done compared to the Brevis Sunspot. Way more digging. These guys will also move shells around and cover them up to prevent others from coming into their territory. So uh, you can see some shells have been uh, buried there on the left while some remain open on the right. These guys do get along somewhat. Uh, they do sometimes squabble, even though I believe they're both males, uh, but generally do get along. So uh, I've left them in here to their own devices. I haven't added any bristlenose catfish uh, to the aquarium, although I think I could, uh, but I just let them be and I'm looking forward to sourcing some uh, in the near future and hopefully breeding them. Anyway guys, on to the next tank. So in this aquarium, we've got my original breeding pair of Gilidochromus regani. My cousin Adam, when I built the fish room, he gave me six of his fry. And from that, I ended up with two breeding pairs. And this tank houses that original breeding pair. They're almost hard to tell who are, which are the breeding pair, but I still can. And I am looking forward to getting those five foot aquariums again to move these fry out so I can breed the Regani again and sell large Regani. And I do intend to keep these guys, even though I have two breeding pairs. I love Regani. They're an interesting fish, said to be the most uh, peaceful of all the Gilidochromus species and uh, they grow the largest, with some reported growing in the lake up to a foot long, 12 inches. That is crazy. I've never seen a Regani that large, anywhere near that. Uh, probably five to six inches is the largest I've ever seen, and that's quite rare, I believe, in the hobby as well. 
Anyway, I recently moved these guys into this aquarium from the sump system, basically because I ran out of room with all the calvus and lay loopy fry that are coming through. These tanks, as you can see, have black, uh, they've got black contact paper, actually. It's not painted, that's black contact paper on the sides and the back. And the base is actually black as well because I have a layer of neoprene instead of styrofoam to cushion these tanks on the stands. Now, as you can see, this does have pull filter sand on the, as a substrate at the bottom of the aquarium. But if I was to put Lay Loopy in these tanks, they would darken up because of the black walls and uh, black uh, back of the tank. So I don't keep Lay Loopies in these aquariums purely for that because I want the Lay Loopy to keep their nice yellow color. So in these tanks, I keep select types of fish, especially because these aren't on a sump system. They're just all individual tanks that are run on sponge filters. None of these tanks on this side of the fish room are heated. The room is air conditioned and uh, gets its warmth and coolness from that aircon. Anyway guys, so there you go, my Gilodochromus Regani, the original breeding pair that I have, and all their fry. Okay, so this tank doesn't have any cichlids in it. It actually just houses my breeding pair of albino bristlenose catfish, as well as their fry that are growing out in here. Now you can see the male on the left there in his little terracotta pot. The female likes to hide underneath all the driftwood that I have in here. And you can see that I run this tank bare bottom with two double-headed sponge filters as well as an internal power filter on the right there. I run them bare bottom purely for ease of maintenance. Bristlenose catfish, if you've ever kept them, they're very messy eaters and they poop a lot. It is very difficult to gravel vac a bristlenose catfish aquarium that has fry in it because fry can easily get sucked up by the siphon. I've many a time sucked up bristlenose catfish fry and had to stop the siphon to get the fry out of the hose. And I hate gravel vacuuming uh, bristlenose catfish tanks because I can suck up fry. The way around that is to keep the tanks bare bottom, don't have any gravel, nothing, and then just pop in a small internal power filter. That will constantly sweep the tank clean. You won't have the fish sitting in feces all day long. The internal power filter will be constantly sweeping the surface of the bottom of the tank up and holding all the feces in the filter. I clean the filter out each and every week. I do a water change. And then the biological filtration happens from the double-headed sponge filters, the two that I've got in the back there. So that's how I keep the majority of my bristlenose catfish tanks. Internal power filter, no aquarium gravel, no substrate in it. Just makes life a whole lot easier, believe me. When I first set up these tanks and I was having to poke around all the bristlenose catfish with the siphon to try and keep the tank clean. Over now, I don't have to worry about that. I just clamp a water change hose to this aquarium with a little sponge on the end of it so I don't suck up any bristlenose catfish. I leave it, let the tank drain out and then fill it back up. Easy as that. All the feces is collected in that internal power filter. So guys, if you really want to breed bristlenose catfish, uh, it doesn't look as nice as a nice planted tank with gravel and whatnot. Uh, but if you do want to breed them and you are serious about breeding them in uh, large numbers, I suggest you do frequent regular water changes. If you want to do daily water changes, that's great. You will grow the fry up very quickly doing that. They'll breed for you readily. Pop in an internal power filter with no substrate and your tank will be spotlessly clean like you see here. So in this aquarium, we've got more bristlenose catfish. The adults that are in here that are producing these fry are short fin, normal colored bristlenose catfish, but they pump out albino bristlenose catfish as well. All the catfish that they pump out are the short fin variety, but they are a combination of normal colored and albino, all from normal colored adults. Now you can see there are several terracotta pots in here, a bristlenose catfish cave on the left there. There's some driftwood and some slate. Also have two double-headed sponge filters, as well as, again, an internal power filter in this aquarium. Now, this internal power filter is the 600 litre per hour power filter. It isn't as strong as the one I have in the first bristlenose catfish tank that I showed you, which is 1,000 litres, I believe, uh, which is a little bit on the strong side. So I've been playing around with the different flow rates. However, uh, you can see there is some debris on the bottom of this aquarium, so it isn't as strong as the other one. And subsequently, some debris will settle on the bottom of this aquarium. Again, bare bottom, as you can see. That's this aquarium. Okay, another bristlenose catfish tank. However, this tank has my long fin bristlenose catfish. They're all, again, the breeding stock that are in here are all normal colored bristlenose. However, these guys, they're also pumping out albino long fins as well as short fins and normal colored bristlenose that are long fin and both short fin. So the one type of bristlenose catfish is producing four different varieties out of the one aquarium. 
Uh, they've got the genetics of both long and short fin as well as albino and normal colored bristlenose catfish. Pretty crazy stuff, uh, but I'm sure it isn't uh, a rare thing in terms of aquascape. Uh, we've got some slate, we've got some terracotta pots, we've got some driftwood, and we've also got a broken plate. I broke that plate a couple months back. It broke just on that edge there, couldn't believe it. What luck, I sanded it back, popped it in the aquarium. Happy days, there's a bristlenose catfish cave. <laughs> also, so you can see we've got two double-headed sponge filters in here, as well as another internal power filter. Uh, the heater is in there, but it's switched off. Uh, I no longer use the heaters in these aquariums, so um, I just need to take them out, and I've actually forgotten, but doing this video has reminded me. I don't keep the lights on these aquariums on hardly ever. The bristlenose catfish, they uh, don't like as much light as other fish, so I just simply don't turn the light on, and the ambient light in the fish room is enough for them to experience a day-night cycle. Now, in this tank, you can see there is some uh, feces building up, in the left hand side of the aquarium. And that's because the sponge in this internal power filter has degraded over time. For some reason, it's the only one that's done that. Uh, so I need to change that out and um, get a new sponge and all that feces will hopefully be picked up. Again though, these internal power filters are only 600 liters per hour. They are kind of on the weak side. So there are some dead spots in the aquarium, but it's not a big problem compared to what these tanks look like before I had the internal power filters, having to clean up that little corner is pretty easy to do. Uh, but basically, when I didn't have the internal power filters, the entire bottom of the tank looked like that left corner. So uh, they make life a whole lot easier. I really, again, recommend that you do that. If you intend to breed uh, your bristlenose catfish in large quantities, it makes your life a whole lot easier when you're doing water changes. Anyway, onto the next tank. What's this? Another bristlenose catfish tank? Yes, correct, it is. <laughs> These guys are albino bristlenose catfish. These are fry from the first albino pair I showed you, uh, and they are quite large. These are, the, these are the largest fry I currently have in the fish room from that albino pair. A lot of the males are starting to develop their bristles that they're known for. And as you can see, the internal power filter in this aquarium is doing a much better job at cleaning the bottom of the tank compared to the last two tanks you saw. That might be just be because uh, there's not a lot of obstructions on the bottom of the tank and water is allowed to flow freely through the aquarium. There is a little dead spot at the back right side of the tank, but that's okay. Again, very easy to clean up. If you were to look at what these tanks look like before I put internal power filters in them, uh, it was crazy, there's feces everywhere. So again, I just do a water change, change out that sponge, clean it out, pop it back in, and that's my water changes done on these tanks for the week. Uh, I don't spawn any fish in here, this is just for them to grow out, uh, take them away from their parents, because once they get to this size, they start to harass the parents a little bit. And I've noticed that some of my bristlenose catfish fry chewing on the male, their father's tail. Uh, so I've been trying to stop that once they get to a certain size, take them out, pop them in a separate tank. Anyway, on to the next one. Okay guys, you can probably guess what's in this aquarium, but you might be slightly wrong. It does have a type of catfish in here, but they are peppermint bristlenose catfish. Now I have four in here and I bought them pretty much from when they were an inch long. They're now pushing three inches almost. And yeah, there are four in this aquarium. They're very hard to see. Again, I just, I hardly ever turn this light on, on their tank, and I just let them be. So there's a lot of driftwood in here for them to rasp on. A couple rocks uh, that were covered in algae that I put in here for them to feed on. And you can see there is one terracotta uh, breeding cave for them. Also, there's two double-headed sponge filters that need to clean, um, and there is no internal power filter. This is the only uh, catfish tank that I have in the fish room that doesn't have an internal power filter. And that's because I can easily vacuum this up. There's no fry, I haven't bred them yet. So uh, it's easy for me to gravel vac this tank, which doesn't have any gravel. I just get the siphon, suck up all the feces, and out it goes. I do, however, intend to get an internal power filter in here. The catfish like a bit of flow, and I'm sure that will benefit them. The largest bristlenose catfish I have in here is in the breeding cave. I haven't seen any spawning activity. I've had them for about a year and a half, I'm being very patient with them, trying to forget that they're even here. And I'm hoping one day I'm gonna see fry all over this aquarium. Uh, but yeah, that day is yet to come, but I'll be sure to document that with you guys when it does happen. But anyway, there you go guys, my peppermint bristlenose catfish tank. And this tank houses my fantail guppies. A lot of different varieties in here. You can see there are hundreds of fish in this aquarium. 
and probably way too many than should be in here. I have a lot of Java moss that's growing at the base of the tank. It's not actually attached to anything, it's just growing at the bottom of the tank and is actually, I guess, attached to the glass of the tank. Uh, that's what it ends up doing and it's growing quite well. And is a natural filter exporting the nutrients out of the aquarium and into its leaves to grow. So a bit of natural filtration there. There are two double-headed sponge filters at the back of the tank, which you can't see uh, because of the sheer amount of guppies that are in this tank. I'm actually thinking about getting rid of these guys. Uh, I don't really have any interest in the guppies, unfortunately, guys. Um, I thought I would. I was um, playing with the idea of growing certain lines of guppies in here, but um, it's just not for me. It's just not my thing. I don't find them interesting. So. Uh, these will be going at some point. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I might just sell them in one go to someone who really wants some guppies. But uh, yeah, these are my fantail guppies. And there's lots of different varieties in here. I'm just a mix of hodgepodge of stuff, which I guess eventually will all look the same in time. But uh, they are quite cool to watch, I suppose. You know, I can put my hand up against, at the top of the tank and they just all go wild thinking they're about to get fed, which is quite cool to see. But uh, yeah, if you do s decide to breed guppies, uh, you know, guppies will eat their own young the moment they're born. So you do need uh, Java moss like this, heavy, heavily planted aquarium. Or if you don't have any plants, which I do recommend you do, but if you don't have any plants, uh, you can make these woolen um, balls basically where they just dangle down, they look like a mop, uh, that just dangle down in the aquarium and that can mimic uh, the java moss and give some shelter to the fry but uh, I'd much rather you go the natural route and use live plants as they play two roles gives a place for the fry to be protected away from the adults they can hide in amongst the leaves of the java moss and it acts as a natural filter uh, exporting nutrients from the aquarium water column into the leaves of the java moss and it looks great like I said, looking at getting rid of these guys so I can use these tanks for other fish that I am much rather interested in keeping. And the last tank to show you guys in the entire fish room is this one. And these have my Endler live bearers. Some people call them guppies. I used to call them guppies. I didn't know that they were actually technically called an Endler live bearer, not technically called a guppy. Uh, but there you go. So something I learned recently. Uh, yeah, these are all the same type, pretty much a purebred and la guppy. Uh, there's no fantail guppies in here, and I purposely keep them that way so that I can keep the bloodline as pure as possible. Uh, again, there's some java moss at the base of this aquarium for protection to the fry, and uh, without that, you won't get uh, large populations of your guppies or endler live bearers. So I really do recommend you pop in some java moss if you intend to breed guppies, or like I said, one of those woolen mats that you can make, it's really easy to make. Uh, but yeah, I've had these guys for a number of years and like the fantail guppies, I am thinking about selling them all, getting rid of them all, so I can use these tanks for other things. Also, I should point out that on this rack, there are two more aquariums. These ones here, this tank here, and this aquarium down here, they look completely dark. Uh, and that's because I've got some black plastic underneath the LED light. So uh, algae doesn't grow in these aquariums. These I'm just using purely as water change reservoirs for my water changes. So they're just holding uh, fresh water, nothing in it. Uh, and I just use a siphon to drain from these tanks to the lower tanks, basically to the bristlenose catfish tanks. So uh, they, that's purely what they're used for. There's no fish in, these, in this or this aquarium. They're just purely used for water changes. Uh, but I am looking to stock them full of fish. Now let's talk about how I run the fish room and what the future plans are for it. Okay, to some of my long-term subscribers, this is probably a new angle of the fish room you haven't seen before. And I'll be looking to film at this angle more frequently over the next few months. And that is because directly in front of the camera is the new stand for my three five-foot aquariums that are arriving in the next few weeks. Like I've said countless times in this video, I can't wait to get them because I need to stock them with the fry that I have growing out. And then regarding the future plans for this fish room, I intend to drill all the tanks you saw that are individual tanks. I'm gonna drill them all and put a sump system on this side of the fish room as well. It's just so much easier to maintain than having 12 separate tanks to do water changes on every single week. With my sump system, it's so much easier to maintain 
I just take out water from one or two aquariums and fill those aquariums back up and then the whole system gets diluted uh, with the water change that I did uh, and that doesn't even take an hour to do. I can just sit back and let it happen with uh, the individual tanks. I have to monitor how each water change is going and fill each and every single aquarium back up. And basically when it comes down to it, I'm lazy when it comes to water changes. Although I do do them every single week, I wanna make them quicker. But for me, with my situation, with how this fish room is designed, I will be making it as easy as possible and drilling all the tanks and then running them on a sump system on this wall. So I'm looking forward to getting that done. I'm gonna document that process for you. It's worked for my original sump system, the first rack I showed you, and there's no reason why it won't work on this system as well. It will be designed a little bit differently to my current sump system. Uh, obviously, I won't have access to the plumbing at the back. I'll have access to the plumbing from the sides and underneath each stand, but uh, I'm still coming up with the design that's what the future holds for this fish room. This wall will be on a sump system as well. Okay, for the next bit, I'm gonna be filming on my mobile phone. It's just a little bit easier because I'll be moving around the fish room a bit. So, this rack run on a sump system, and here is that sump. So you can see, pothos plant is growing out of the sump, and I'll briefly run through how the sump works. So, water flows, as you can see, into this chamber. This is mechanical filtration. It is all filter sponge. It's hard to see, but the filter sponge layer starts here, and it's layers of filter sponge all the way down to the egg crate. So water flows in from the three rows of tanks, goes all the way down through all this filter sponge, goes through the egg crate, up this bubble trap, and then over into the biological filtration side. This chamber has a range of Seeker Matrix, crushed black lava rock, crushed red lava rock. They're exactly the same, it's just a different color. And then I eventually found these aquaponic beads. Uh, they were sold at my local hardware shop and I bought a couple bags of those, popped them in here. They float forever and they are actually a pumice type of stone. So they are perfect for this. I wish I actually purchased all of this to fill up this entire chamber. For one, the Seeker Matrix was very expensive and there's actually eight liters of the stuff here and you can see how thin that eight liters of strip is because it goes all the way back across the sump which is two foot wide. So this is a four foot long aquarium that's two foot wide and uh, two and a half foot deep. But I'll get to that in a second with why it's that wide. I'll just continue on with the biological filtration side. So we've got the pothos plant in here growing through this media. And that pothos plant is taking up nutrients out of the water and is naturally filtering the water. It's assisting me in keeping that water low of nitrates. So it's taking that up to grow its leaves. And you can see there's a little uh, LED lamp here that is uh, lighting up this pothos plant. It's all run uh, on a timer and that turns on, on, off and on itself. So if we continue on through the sump, water flows down through the biological filtration media. You can see all the roots of the pothos plant growing up this bubble trap and then over into the return pump section. Uh, so I need to cut those roots, but that's okay. In here we've got two 300 watt Eheim heaters sitting next to each other and they are there purely as redundancy if the aircon gets a little, um, if the aircon was to cut out or wasn't doing enough on a, particular, on a particularly cold day, those heaters will ensure that these aquariums are heated sufficiently. So they're there as backup, as redundancy if the aircon was to fail. And then we've got two return pumps. I've also got this fill line. Here I know, once I fill uh, the sump or the tanks up to this fill line, uh, if there was to be a blackout, all the water in the plumbing is going to drain below the bulkheads and drain out of the plumbing and fill up this uh, sump. So this is why the sump is the size it is. So, if there was a blackout, water is going to drain below the bulkheads in each of the aquariums. It's going to drain from all the, all the plumbing that's at the back of the aquariums, which I'll show you in a second, and it's going to fill up in this tank. It's going to raise, 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 and it's going to get to about this level. All that water, all that water volume is currently just in the one, about one inch of each tank. Uh, so each tank will drain out about less than an inch. 
to the sump and water that's in the drain lines will also drain to the sump and we'll fill it up from there to about there. So you can see I've got quite a bit of room left, four to five inches of room left in the sump. If I was to fill the sump up, say to here, with a water change and then we'll have a blackout, the water will drain to the sump like normal and then overflow. There'll be too much water in the system. So having that fill line, I know, if I fill to that point, it's gonna be fine, completely fine. It will never overflow. So that's my gauge. Uh, I sometimes let the water evaporate to about here. So when I top up evaporated water into the system, I top up fresh water that's got dechlorinated in it, doesn't have any roof lake buffers or anything in it. So these are the two return pumps that I have. And you can see there attaches some thick PVC. That PVC are actually check valves. Both pumps are connected to check valves. Now what the check valves do is, in the event of a blackout, they will prevent water from flowing back from the return lines. So water, you can't help it, it is gonna flow from the drain lines into the sump. But I've got two check valves on the return lines. When the water cuts, those check valves close, water can't flow out of that plumbing and it stays in the return line plumbing. Now onto the controllers for the return pumps. They are two DCP 15,000 litre per hour pumps, but you can see they're both running at 35 watts. So I am basically filtering 20 aquariums with 70 watts of power. That is another benefit of having a sump system. Save on your running costs by just filtering with one or two of these return pumps. Now you can see they're labeled. One says bottom, one says top. This one obviously controls the top row of tanks, only controls the top row of tanks. And then this one controls the middle row and bottom row of tanks. So we've got 12 tanks on the top row, controlled by one pump, and then the other pump is controlling eight tanks. But they are larger tanks, and the pump doesn't have to pump as hard because they're not as high up. To be honest with you guys, I could have gone with a lower uh, powered pump, say the 10,000 litre pumps, uh, because the 15,000 litre is a bit much for these tanks, but I wasn't sure when I was designing the, the tanks, the stands, how much uh, power I was gonna need, how much uh, flow rate I was gonna need, so I went with higher flow rate, because I figured I could always lower it, but I can't always increase it if I need more. So that's why I went with two 15,000 litre per hour pumps. And again, they're running at 35 watts each, they have a max of 110 watts each. And if I was to do that, these tanks will flood. <laughs> and that's because the bulkheads at the back of each tank are a certain size. They're a one inch bulkhead. And those bulkheads go into drain lines that are 25 mil wide, and then go into a common drain line that's 50 mil wide. And then they drain into the sump. So with the sump, The three levels of aquariums have their own common drain line. So the top row of tanks all drain to this PVC pipe and drain out here. The middle row of tanks drain to this PVC pipe and the two four footers just drain to this back pipe here that um, has been drilled into the back of the sump. Now I'll show you the plumbing. It looks crazy. It took a few months to build it all and connect it all up and fix water leaks. Water leaks are inevitable in this many joins. Just move my nets out of the way. <laughs> but essentially, this is one large aquarium. The benefits of having a sump system basically, are, for me, outweigh the risks. So there are risks involved in running a sump system, the main one being disease. Disease can easily spread through a sump system like this. I, then, I can, however, quarantine any tank off that I want. When I buy new fish, if I was to quarantine fish in this system, I can quarantine fish in any tank, and the way I've designed the plumbing doesn't affect any filtration on either side of the tank above or below. I can completely isolate one tank out of the entire system, and it has no effect on the rest of the system whatsoever. No tank drains into another tank, None of that. Each tank has its own individual inlet that can be shut off with a ball valve at the back of the stand. 
So if I wanted to isolate, say, this tank, I close off the inlet so no water flows in. I drain the water below the bulkhead, and then this tank is cut, shut off from the rest of the system. The tanks on either side and above still operate no problem whatsoever because no tank flows into another aquarium. They all flow into the sump via these common drain lines. So you can see the common drain line for the top row, the common drain line for the middle row, and the common drain line, this one here, is for the two forfeiters. And that is how my sump system works for this rack. And I'll be doing something similar to this wall. Am I crazy? Yes. <laughs> I know what I'm in store for. A lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of time. There's going to be some leaks in that system, but I'll be able to fix them up. So that's all coming. So if you want to see how I do that, be sure to subscribe to my channel because we're all going to learn something along the way. Can't wait to do it on this system. It's going to make my life a whole lot easier. So if you're new to my channel and you enjoyed that video, I do weekly videos that are published 7 a.m. every Tuesday morning, Sydney, Australia time. I also do monthly vlogs where I give an update about some of the tanks in the fish room, not all the tanks, but I give an update on key things that have happened in the fish room over the past month. So if you enjoyed this type of content, why don't you consider subscribing to my channel? So there you have it guys, my full fish room tour for the year 2022. I really hope you enjoyed that video and found it informative. If you did, please give me a thumbs up, comment and subscribe to the channel. I really would appreciate it. All right guys, I'm gonna wrap this video up now. Thanks heaps for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.